you know, is it is it changing over time? Is it changing in a stochastic fashion, not merely a static fashion? Okay. Um, so, so I noted that you know here we're frequently examining the impact of changing sort of our working hypothesis for how the system might work, um, or a deeply held hypothesis, um, and our decision of how to describe the current situation with parameter values, um, how to abstract system behavior. And in structural sensitivity analysis, we're particularly varying the structure of the model to see its impact on results. So if we had just one more transition, if we allowed people to lose immunity, how would that affect the results? If, people's, um, if people had an immune state for gonorrhea, that they could remain immune for some amount of time, how would that affect the burden of gonorrhea in the population? How would that affect the outcomes of different interventions? Um, and sometimes we recalibrate the model process we'll be talking about probably on Tuesday in this process. So here we're considering uncertainty about sort of the mapping from current state to the next state, sort of the the rules of the game, the description of sort of the, the structure of the models associated with kind of the defining sort of the behavioral um, evolution of the model over time. It turns out that there's uh, a variety of methods we might get a chance to talk about at the end of this class called predictor-corrector methods that, that basically involve dual evolution on the one hand of a model so you're simulating this model, but as you're simulating the model, you're observing the world and learning from it. It's a little bit reminiscent of our decision tree approach, but the idea is that um, you, you make a prediction using the model for where things should be going forward. And then when, when a certain time has elapsed, you check that prediction. And if it's off, you correct what the model's prediction was from that time and then you go forward from there. So you're sort of regrounding the model periodically. You're trying to adjust model state as well as parameter estimates on an ongoing basis, given in a way that weighs the uncertainty about the model predictions. So there's some model uncertainty, and there's some, uh, there's some uncertainty associated with the new observations. So you can imagine a plane flying with a predictor-corrector system, such as a Kalman filter. And, and it's plotting forward where its position will be in a minute's time based on the thrust of the engines and based on the wind speed it measures and based on um, you know, the, the weight of the plane and, and so on. But maybe that's imperfect. Maybe it's not taking into account the fact that it's hailing outside or that you know, you're you're flying through a, a dense cloud or something. So it's likely to be somewhat off. It's not likely to be a perfect prediction of where you are. Um, and meanwhile, it's getting signals maybe from GPS. So it's getting signals maybe every minute from GPS. And GPS signals are also error prone. There's some range of uncertainty about them especially if you can't see one or more of the satellites, et cetera. There's some variability in them. And a predictor-corrector method would essentially take into account the model's prediction for where I am. So another minute elapses. Model predicted I'd be here. The satellite tells me I'm there. How do I fuse those together to get a new best estimate? And then start with that and go forward from there in my predictions about where I'll be next time or you know, after another minute yet or another minute. So here we're kind of adjusting our estimate of our model state, in that case the position of the plane. In the case of an epidemic model, it might be the number of people currently infected. When we get new data in, we'll say, hmm, so the hospital reported you know, an intake of this many patients, so, you know, we might guess there's at least that many, but some of those might, might not be true H1N1 diagnoses and so on. Maybe some people got it, didn't go to the hospital, so there's some variability in that estimate. And this is where the model thought we'd be by now. So we'll fuse them together, get a new estimate, and go forward from here. Um, so uh, 
Here, the assumption is the error in the model is defined by some probability distribution or some pro process over time. Um, we're not going to talk about those much right now. If we're lucky, we might get to some comments on them in the end, particularly common filtering. Okay, um, let's talk about static uncertainty sensitive analyses. So in this case, uh, basically we we seek to to undertake sensitivity analyses with respect to parameters or respect to initial states. We may wish to investigate there the effects of different assumptions, or we may wish to investigate the impacts of different policies. For example, if we could lower the, um, the risk of gestational diabetes by a certain fraction, how would that impact the results? Or if we could lower obesity rates, how would that impact the occurrence of end-stage renal disease in, in future years? Okay. Um, and the fundamental factor here is that when we have nonlinear models of the sort we've been talking about, some parameters matter more than others, particularly in certain situations rather than other situations. So we may be, we have may have same relative amount of uncertainty about a parameter. Say, you know, uh, we're, we're our 95% confidence interval, but our different parameters, you know, is within 10% of the value. But that 10% of uncertainty could make a much bigger difference for certain parameters than it could for others in terms of model output. Sometimes that, that given level of uncertainty about a parameter makes a big difference. Sometimes it makes a very modest difference. And they can be different by factor of, by orders of magnitude and different different in terms of how much they impact the model output. So we're going to be looking at how within any logic we conduct these sort of uh, sensitivity analyses. We can conduct analyses. And I think I will just, um, in the interest of, of, of using our time next time, well, I'll just note that we started to look at this last time. So if we go to our SIR model and we go to um, this, uh, this same Monte Carlo 2D histogram, uh, and we go to the general tab, we'll note that here we can do variation of these parameters within ranges. We could say they're fixed, or we could have them range. And, and in fact, last time we, we examined this. Um, and we might examine the impact of um, changing uh, different parameters here, we can specify the minimum value that they should have, the, the maximum, and then the step size, so it systematically goes between them. Um, and um, uh, when we do that, it will figure out, okay, how many runs does it have to do? We saw that some last time. We may also have multi-way sensitivity analyses. So here, we might be examining, for example, possible combinations of values. Here, this one goes... Um, from 5 to 25, step 5. This other one go from 0 to 10, step 1. In this case, we'll have all possible combinations of these values, all possible combinations of those values examined. Okay, so there's 11 possible values for that, um, for example, and we may run it by the five possible values for the other things, and we'll get 55 runs run out. Okay. Um, another thing we may want to do is feed in a probability distribution. So instead of simply stepping these things through some values, we may want to feed in a, a draw a value of a parameter from probability distribution over and over and over again using a Monte Carlo method, run an ensemble of these realizations, and then summarize the results, the emergent results in terms of variability in terms of the output, the distributions in terms of model outputs. So here, what we could do is we could choose free form, and we could then specify a distribution for a given parameter using an expression. And each time it goes to run, it will draw from, it will run that expression, draw from the value, run it with the according value. So we could run this thing a hundred times with different draws from this value. Okay, so we might get something like this, where we have some 
some draw from this distribution, and what's induced at a given point in time is a distribution over this output. There's some, if we were to slice it here at 160, there's some histogram, again, which approximates a distribution. And the more and more runs we'd have, the more precisely we'd approximate that distribution um, on that value. Okay. Um, important point here is when we're looking at system dynamics models, a very important uncertainty concerns initial states. We typically don't know exactly how many people start in each stock at each time. In an aggregate model, and, and the same thing applies with the nature-based model, in an aggregate model, um, we can actually vary that more readily. We just examine the effects of dividing up people differently among these stocks so that it matches our data. And we'll see how to do, we'll see in calibration some of the ways we, we might judge something like that. In an agent-based model, the initial state is much, much more variable because we have all these individual people that could start in different states. So typically what you adjust is the fraction of the population that starts with different states without trying to go through all possible interpretations of which particular people start in a given state because there's too many combinations of these things. Okay, so what have we seen today? Well, we've seen more about stochastics. We've talked about ways that any logic can allow you to summarize data over many runs of a model and some of the mechanics of how it gets out the data from each run in turn and salvages it and squirrels it away in a parameter variation experiment or in a calibration experiment. That will be useful for problem three, problem set three. We have further seen some of the ways in which it summarizes these things visually using these Monte Carlo TV histograms. We've talked about some of the semantics of that, some of the data sets on which it's based. This, these data sets which define the number of bins in the horizontal and vertical dimensions and which allow you to define envelopes. And we've seen we could display envelopes around some median of values or you could display bin, the relative number of counts that fall into different bins. We further talked about variability in our uncertainty about a model and how we can use sensitivity analysis to examine some aspects of this uncertainty, concentrating on parameter uncertainty. And we've seen how we could systematically vary parameters in a single dimension, such as this, or along multiple dimensions at the same time, and examine variations. And we've seen how we could draw those parameters from distribution with a specified number of runs so that we are doing a multi-way sensitivity analysis with respect to a set of parameters together where those parameters distributions are, are, are values are drawn from, from some distribution. Um, and uh, once again, we can summarize with Monte Carlo 2D. Uh, 2D. Uh, we talked a little bit about sensitivity in initial states and sensitivity in model structure, which is a very important element. How would you capture, as a final question here, how would you capture sensitivity analysis? If you want to do sensitivity analysis about model structure to capture the results of uncertainty in model structure, what would be a way you could do that within any logic? So if I didn't know in my chlamydia model whether there should be an immune state, or if I am not sure whether you know, my model of, um, of uh, diabetes should should assume some period of, with, uh, you know, uh, hidden end-stage renal disease. How might I perform a sensitive analysis with respect to that? I'll give you a hint. Any logic doesn't give you a magic way to do this. It doesn't give you an automatic way to do this. But how could you do that? You want to examine one hypothesis Maybe it's with different channels open, you know, ch channels open, another one without an extra type of channel. How would you, how would you do that? Yeah, exactly. And sometimes you can actually affect that, effect, E-F-F-E-C-T. You can effect that, you can accomplish that by setting a parameter value. Setting the transition rate for that transition to zero, for example, right? That's an option. 
So sometimes you can kind of turn off that transition, essentially. And that's a useful exercise. But sometimes you may remove a state or add a state in and run it with that version of the model and with the earlier version of the model, say, without that state. So you compare with and without the state. You run the same scenario maybe many, many times, say 100 times, with the state and without the state. And you then you compare the results there. So you can do it, just you do it manually typically. Occasionally you can kind of tweak it by turning it off, turning it on with, by changing the rate. But um, basically the same mechanism of running scenarios can be used. You'll just have two different versions of the model typically with and without that structure. Okay? Okay, so next time we're going to be talking about calibration. Calibration will be an extremely um, uh, valuable element for some of the models being built in this class. And it may take us, because of that reason, I'm going to spend a bit more time on it. It may take uh, two, two lectures. Okay, so that's all.